Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of CRNA School Prep Academy podcast. I'm your host, Jenny Fennell, CRNA, and welcome back. Today is a very special episode here on the podcast because we have officially hit our one year mark as a podcast, and we are closely approaching 100,000 downloads. Holy moly. Thank you guys so, so very much. I can't even hardly believe that, to be quite honest. I'm kind of shocked, but I'm super thrilled, and I want to do something special on this episode. And one of the things I really love doing is I love listening to my students. I love hearing from you guys. And so I actually surveyed you guys inside of the Facebook community, which is I see you dreaming about anesthesia. If you're not a part of that Facebook community, I highly encourage you to do so. And I asked you guys, what do you want me to talk about? We're coming up on our one year podcast anniversary, which I want to make really special. And so what better way than to hear from you and what you want to hear from me? And so you picked it, which is, again, how to stay successful in CRNA school. That is the topic that you have requested to hear about. So I'm so excited to bring this episode to you today, and let's go ahead and get right into it. So first, let's talk about academic success. So many of you are probably suffering from imposter syndrome, as I'm... I'm right there with you. Most days I suffer from this too. And I think it's a very common thing. And I think even 4.0 students who go into CRNA school worry about, can you handle the rigors of CRNA school? Um, I know I was there again, because I had a history of not being such a successful student at some point. So of course, it crossed my mind as to whether or not I would flunk out of CRNA school. And I think even again, 4.0 students worry whether they're going to be able to handle CRNA school. So let's kind of get into the academic realm. And also, I do have a podcast episode on on imposter syndrome. I highly encourage you to check it out. Um, I can't remember the episode off the top of my head. um, But again, if you go to SiranaSchoolPrepAcademy.com podcast, all the podcast episodes are listed. Or if you're listening from an Apple app, you can scroll back through our episodes and find it. Um, But again, so let's touch on some things that you can do to continue your academic success. One thing that may seem obvious, but I want to point it out is do your own work. And what I mean by this is I see a lot of students fall on other students and ask for their study guides or any study tools that they are using, which I encourage you to do. However, do not let this replace your own studies uh, for someone else's. Meaning if someone else has done a study guide, don't just take their study guide and study from it. You need to do the work and actually look up the answers because this is, again, a very active learning process. And that is how things are going to stick in your brain. And it also helps you build connections with uh, the things you're learning. So Again, you got to you have to be able to do your own work if you want the information that you're learning to stick and also connect it with other pieces that you're learning. Um, memorization is not going to get you through CRNA school. You have to actually understand the material and you actually have to be able to relate it back to other material, because if you can't, you're going to be everyone always says it's like drinking from a fire hose, which is true because they're throwing so much information at you, which is why memorization is not going to cut it. You actually have to uh, do a technique called interleaving and you have to connect the dots. It's almost kind of like a puzzle. So if you like puzzles, then think about anesthesia school as a big puzzle um, because you're going to be kind of connecting the dots and filling in the pieces as you go. So again, do your own work. Don't um, replace someone else's study guide for doing your own. One of the things that we would do when I was in school is we had a two hour commute to class. And so we would have a study guide, for example, we would all do the study guide. Um, but we would all, what we would do is, um, we would all do it ourselves, but one of us would then cover certain sections, meaning I would do the entire thing myself, but then on the car ride up, I would, uh, quiz my classmates over maybe one through 10. And then, um, someone else would take a turn. They would quiz you over, you know, 10 through 20. And we'd all take turns asking each other questions from our study guide. And the reason why it was so key that we all did it ourselves is because what was interesting is I found that like, uh, for example, I, I, my, my section was one through 10 to quiz everyone else on people would give me the answers. And I'm like, Oh, you, they would add to my own study guide, meaning they would actually fill in blanks that I had missed. Um, and vice versa things on my study guide. Um, I would fill them in and they would miss. And so we all did it ourselves, but we used each other to help each other see our blind spots. And so that was a very, very, uh, worthwhile study technique. So again, if you're getting together in groups, maybe try that technique out and see if that helps. But remember, doing your own work and doing your own study guide is really the best way to go. So just as important as to do your own study guide is you have to understand how you study. So this is something that I struggled with very early on in college, my freshman year in college and and high school and all of that. 
Um, however, I was fortunate enough to figure this out at that point because it meant me not pursuing nursing because, again, I didn't get accepted into the College of Nursing. So I had to figure out how to study to get better grades to get into grad school. Well, I'm telling you guys, it was like a light switch went off in my brain. Um, when I finally figured out what worked for me, it just was kind of like I, I never looked back. I just kept finding success from there on out. And don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean that studying became easy. It doesn't mean that things just come naturally to me now. That's definitely not the case. However, when you try different techniques, you find things that are more effective um, so you can study more efficiently. Okay, so it becomes more effective. Um, it doesn't mean that it's easier. It just means it's more effective as far as getting you to understand what you're learning. So again, you have to understand how you study. And what I have heard from so many students throughout the years of mentoring is a lot of times you can coast by with the bare minimum in undergrad and do okay. Um, and then you get to grad school and it's a whole new ball game as far as what they throw at you, how much they expect you to do every single week. And you get quickly overwhelmed and realize that your study techniques are not efficient and not as effective as they need to be to handle the amount of information that is thrown at you. That is by far the hardest part about grad school. It's not the information itself for the most part, it's how much information at once. And so again, um, knowing how you study effectively and efficiently is really key to being able to handle the rigors of CRNA school. And um, recently we did share um, a study, how to study effectively lecture with our email community. Um, if you have missed that, I am going to, because I love you guys, I'm going to give you an opportunity to purchase this lecture. We actually, I presented this lecture during our fall conference. It was praised, people loved it. And I just had someone recently reach out to me who purchased both the How to Study Effectively and Growth Mindset lecture. Um, she's a new SRNA and she thanked me so much. And she says, I can't wait to review this multiple times during my CRNA journey. She again, just gained acceptance. And so I wanted to share this with you guys here on the podcast, something special again um, for you guys. Again, it's only going to be here on the podcast that you can get this lecture. And again, it's how to study effectively. Um, it's from the book, Make It Stick. I've used that book to help guide me, but I also combined techniques that I have used throughout the years to help me learn how to study effectively. So I highly encourage you to check it out. And again, the link for that course is going to be in the show notes. The other really important thing for you to do is to seek help early. So other time, other students I have mentored when say something bad happens, like let's like say they do bad on a test and it, it actually hinders them from pursuing or continuing on in the program. Um, one of the biggest takeaways from when I ask students kind of what happened, et cetera, et cetera, it's they didn't seek help early. They knew they were in trouble. They knew they were in trouble before they actually got in trouble. However, they just thought they could handle it. They thought they could do it. They thought they could push through. And it may not have been that they weren't capable as far as getting the grade, but maybe they had things in their personal life that were hindering them from taking the time to adequately study. And so seeking help early on, if you're not understanding the concept or if you're having personal issues that are affecting your ability to study is really key with being successful academically in your CRNA program. And really any any time throughout the program to be successful, you have to know when to ask for help and you have to make sure you're asking for help before the problem occurs. Meaning speak up, speak up for yourself. If you have to advocate for the patient, you have to advocate for yourself, right? We teach advocacy. Well, you have to also know how to speak up for yourself as well. And this includes seeking help early on, early and often. Do not be ashamed that you need to sit in the program director's office for a review. That is what they're there for. They want you to be successful. So make sure you're utilizing that time. Again, not all programs will allow you to review tests afterwards, but if they do allow you to review tests, find out what you missed. Because knowing what you missed will allow you to then review the material so you can try to understand why you missed the question. Um, typically, if you're reviewing this material, you have to do it inside um, a program faculty's office while someone's sitting there. But again, a lot of programs will allow you to do this. So make sure you're staying after class to take advantage of these opportunities. Okay, so review old material along with the new. The reason why I point this out is because depending on whether you're in a front loaded or integrated program, you're going to be learning sometimes things that are happening in clinical essentially are not going to be happening at the same time you're learning them in, in, um, in your didactic portion of your schooling. And so what happens is it could be a year that you've since you've learned pediatrics and now you're in your pediatric rotation. 
And same thing with board prep. You really have to be always hitting old material along with the new because what happens is you actually do the interleaving technique where you're building upon a foundation that you set a year ago. But if you don't take time to review what you set a year ago, it's going to get kind of bogged down and stuck in your brain, but you're not going to be able to actively retrieve it. So you have to go back. You have to not only think about it. So kind of how I did this in school and what seemed to be effective for me is Okay, so I'm learning the material, uh, some information that I know I've learned before in some capacity, but I'm having a hard time remembering exactly how I learned it and what capacity I learned it, but I know I have. And so I try really hard to write down and understand what I do know about this topic and what I've learned before. But if I can't fully grasp what I have learned before, I then go and find notes that I've taken before, um, old lectures that have covered the topic, textbook readings over the topic, and I hit that as I'm learning the new topic, meaning I actually stop learning the new thing and go back and review the old thing after I have tried to recall it, okay? And what that does is it forces me to use effort in trying to recall the information, but I stop and review the old information once I get it, once I'm like, oh, cool, it clicked. Then I stop that and I go back to the new information and I continue learning from there. But I stop because what I want to do as I'm learning new material is make sure I have a good foundation to build upon it because that is what's going to help you with recall on a test is you have to have base knowledge to understand a more complex concept. So sometimes when you're studying and you're learning new concepts, you actually have to stop what you're doing and review old material so you can keep going forward with the new material. That's hopefully that I didn't lose you there, but um, so reviewing old material with new material is really key, especially, again, if it's been a while since um, you have reviewed any of the information. You have to think about school as it's kind of a continuum and you can't just it's not like once you learn it, you're done with it. You're always going to be using it in a fluid motion. So it's going to recall it's going to take you going back and reviewing old material. All right, so let's go into um, clinical success. We'll cover that one. Whoops. All right, so in clinical, you really want to be prepared. And this may sound like, okay, Jenny, well, what does that mean? What does being prepared look like in clinical? You know, and yes, of course, you probably know about Jaffe, that big giant textbook, I still have my Jaffe. <laughs> um, so yes, including, so clinical preparedness looks like, I'm gonna kind of explain to you what this means. It's not just preparing for your case. Yes, that's a big component. However, you have to not only prepare for your case, you have to understand why you're doing the case, meaning understand why the patient's having that procedure. What kind of disease process exists underneath the procedure that is the reason they're having this done? The reason why you have to understand that and not just the surgical procedure as far as, yeah, you should know what kind of EBL, whether it's going to be a MAC, a general, LMA, endotracheal tube, right, uh, maybe a a one lung ventilation kind of case, or you have to understand all of those things, but you have to also understand, well, why are they having this case done in the beginning? What is their disease process that is requiring them to have this case? And you may not know your patient's full medical history while you're looking up your case the night before. Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. It depends on your clinical site and how much access you have to look up your cases for the next day. Um, but even if you don't know your patient's full medical history, you can still gauge what's going on with them that will then help you make a better game plan. Okay, so you have to understand if they're having this done, maybe they're a high risk for, um, you know, de desaturating during induction, or maybe they're high risk for um, having an aspiration, for example, or, you know, you have to understand somewhat of their disease process that kind of clues you into maybe they're high risk for post-operative nausea, or they're, maybe they're going to have a hard time having pain control, um, because I know this is a very painful procedure. So kind of understanding the case more than just understanding the physical aspects of the surgery. You have to understand the patient and the patient's needs that go along with the surgery. So I hope that made sense. Um, but being prepared and trying your best and you guys, especially when you're new in clinical, give yourself grace because this is very hard. It's not super easy and it doesn't come naturally. It's going to take time and experience to really understand how all this works together. You're sometimes you're just not going to know and you're going to go into this kind of blind and you have to learn on the go. And that's okay. I'm not saying you have to know everything before you enter the clinical realm, but you have to do your best. Okay. Um, and really where this can start is first thing in the morning. If you get there early enough to where you do a thorough preoperative assessment, 
Then you start thinking about these things and then you can give report to your preceptor and they're gonna be like, wow, you're a rock star. You got this. And even if you don't get all of it, even if you've just taken the time to think and start asking questions like, well, I think this might be something that they're high risk for because of X, Y, and Z, even if you're not right, the fact that you've taken time to think that through and give this information to your preceptor, they're going to reward you for it. They're going to feel like, hey, it's cool. You gave it some thought. Actually, this is what I'm thinking. And you can go back and forth. I really enjoy when my students bring things to my attention because sometimes there are things I don't even think about. And I'm like, oh, that's a good point. And so when you're doing this, it's going to build that trust. And trust is very important in the clinical realm when you want to excel in clinical because the more trust your preceptor has with you, the more they're gonna let you do independently. And that's always gonna be your goal in clinical is to really try to function independently because it's gonna really set you up for success afterwards um, or at least allowing you to feel like you have it. Because I, I I remember getting ready to graduate being like, oh my gosh, can I really do this by myself? Like, I'm not gonna have anyone here. What if I don't know when to really extubate a patient? Ah, what if they spasm because I pull the tube too soon? But you know what? I was fine. And you're going to be fine too. You will be ready. But sometimes I think when you don't get as much independent experience when you're a student, you may question these things more when you're getting ready to graduate. So again, um, building the trust. And sometimes that's hard, at least in my experience sometimes, because I was at a really big facility where I was lucky if I worked with a CRNA more than once, because like, there was hundreds of CRNAs. It was a giant medical facility. And so if I was with a preceptor like three times, that was like, that was good. Um, so that can be hard to build trust when you're only with someone a few times. But some clinical sites, you're with the same CRNA for like weeks in a row, every single week for the entire duration that you're at that clinical site. And so then it's really easy to build trust and to, again, be able to establish a relationship that will allow you to work more independently. So just keep that in mind. Um, even if your preceptor doesn't give you a lot of trust in the beginning, sometimes it takes time to build that trust and to, to give your preceptor some grace with that too. Uh, but again, the more you can think about your case prior in the morning, understand your patient and the patient medical history, not just the surgical procedure, the more trust you're going to build with your um, with your CRNA. Um, also, I want to point out initiative. And what this means is I've had some students who uh, maybe vocalize how they think that, you know, CRNAs don't like it when you ask questions or they don't like it. So when I've dug into this a little bit, cause I'm like, well, whoever, first of all, whoever criticizes you for asking a question, that's just not, that's not right. Um, you should always ask questions. However, I think what I've tried to understand is where some people are coming from or some preceptors are coming from is if the student's asking a question that the preceptor feels like they should know or should take initiative to find out. And so that's where I think this fine line lays where maybe the preceptor came back at you and said, well, you need to go look that up. But that isn't the right way to handle it, by the way. But I'm just letting you know you will experience that probably at some point during your clinical career. Um, but the reason why they probably say that is because they want to see initiative from you to look things up versus just asking a question. And the reason for this is not because they want to be mean, at least hopefully it's not. Um, it's well, a one, they might not know themselves. Um, and two, they know that an active learning process is kind of back when I had mentioned, do your own work. It's from taking initiative to look it up. You actually learn more by doing that than just being told the answer. Again, it'd be like you studying for a test by just borrowing your friend's study guide and trying to memorize what they wrote down versus you actively looking up the information. Because when you're actively looking up the information, you're building those inner connections and you're building on your fun fundamental knowledge that will allow you to understand. And so when they tell you to look something up, it may not be because they don't want to help you. It may be because they want to see you take initiative for your own learning and to be responsible for your own progress that way. So just keep that in mind um, as far as taking initiative. All right, classmates. I've mentioned this before, but the reason why I want to touch on this again is, yes, lean on your classmates, form study groups, um, utilize each other's study resources. However, do your own work, but you can definitely mix things up by reviewing what they have done. So again, they may understand things differently than you. But one thing I want to point out to be very careful about is make sure the work that you are borrowing is not something you would be turning in. Um, some, I mean, schools will see this as cheating. So keep that in mind. If you're borrowing any kind of work from an upperclassman, make sure it's not work that they physically had turned in. And I'm even telling you, if someone comes to you and asks for something from you, that is something that you had to turn in for a grade, do not give it to someone else. Because again, even if it's not your intention, um, again, I've had, I've, I've seen students potentially get in trouble for this. And so I want to make sure I'm warning you. And this whole episode is about your success in CRNA school. And so I want to make sure I'm pointing out that 
You can't just give any types of assignments to other classmates for them to borrow because again, there's a fine line between giving helpful advice and possibly cheating. So make sure that um, that doesn't happen to you and make sure that again, if you're borrowing things from upperclassmen, underclassmen, whoever, that it's stuff that they physically have made to help them study and not something that they are turning in for a grade, okay, or an assignment. All right, hit the books. Um, you're probably like, oh my gosh, really, Jenny? Like, I don't want to hit the books. I already hit the books enough. But the reason why I put this in here is because kind of what I touched on earlier for academic success is you have to review the material. You have to take the time to understand. And so even, even when you're looking up um, a case, you might be understanding the, the surgical aspects of the case, but do you understand the disease process of the case? And that's going to require you to probably hit your, your books a little bit heavier than just Jaffe. Um, so that's what I meant by hit the books. You have to not only understand the 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 surgical aspect of the case, but also the pathophysiology behind it. And then also pharmacology, you guys. So if you know in your case, you're going to more than likely use Clevaprex, you should be looking up Clevaprex as well and understanding exactly how that works. Um, and that goes for any drugs. You know, a typical general case, you use certain drugs, but is there any drugs that you may use? Like for an awake crany, maybe you're going to use Prestidex. Do you understand Prestidex and how it works? And so um, make sure you're taking initiative to not only look up the case, but you're looking up the pathophysiology and pharmacology that will also play into how the case unfolds. All right. And then take challenging cases. So this can be hard, especially when you're facing burnout, when you're getting ready to graduate and you have senioritis. Sometimes you're like, I'm just going to coast through here and get out the door, right? Um, I feel ya. I've been there. I remember feeling that way, being like, I'm totally over this. <laughs> um, I totally understand that that feeling. Um, but that being said, you're not doing yourself any favors by doing that. So I want to make sure I'm pointing out that if you really want to push yourself to get as much out of it as you possibly can, and, and remind, remind yourself too sometimes that you are paying to be there. You are paying for this education. You are paying for this experience. So you should get the most value out of it, right? And, you know, when you're getting ready to graduate, you may be having those fears of being on your own. Well, what better way to experience a scary, challenging case than with your when you're with a CRNA, right? So taking the challenging cases, especially towards the end of your program, it's going to only do you favor. You're going to progress easier, faster, smoother by taking challenging cases. Do not shy away from them. Even if you get there that day and you had planned out a case, you had all pretty mapped out, you had exactly what you're going to do, and now you have to find a home because your case got canceled, find a challenging case. If it exists and there's not a student in there, take it. And yes, it might be kind of rocky and you're going to be scared, you're going to be overwhelmed, but you should embrace it because you're going to get some learning out of it. And just be honest with your preceptor. Hey, my case got canceled. Is it okay if I'm in here with you? I haven't prepared for this, but I'll tell you what I know about it. And I just want to use this as a learning experience. Nine times out of 10, probably 9.9 .9 times out of 10, they're going to be proud of you for doing that and understand where you're coming from because they were in your shoes at 1.2. And they'll be happy to take you under their wing and teach you the way. All right. So make sure you're giving yourself the opportunity to take challenging cases. All right, so now we're going to go into overall success. So I really want to uh, touch on this because there's kind of a big picture here. I know I just covered academic and clinical. However, I really want to paint kind of an overall picture of what success should look like to you as a student. All right. Um, and the first thing I want to point out is time management. Now, you may be cringing because you're like, oh, my gosh, but I'm so overwhelmed with my time. How the heck am I supposed to manage time when I have no time? Um, and first of all, I'm right there with you. Most days I feel the same way where I'm like, holy cow, I wish days were like 48 hours long sometimes because I just don't have enough time. I, I mean, if you guys are watching me on YouTube, I don't even have time to comb my hair. <laughs> I just wake up, brush my teeth, and that's about all I do most days anyways. Um, so I totally understand time management is hard. It's challenging. However, it's really a necessity if you want to be successful in CRNA school. So whatever that looks like, whether that's an online tool, there's lots of them. There's, uh, uh, there's Asana. I use Asana. Again, that's kind of a um, business tool, but you can use it for personal life. Um, there's also planners, you know, however you want to do it. There's also apps in your phone. Um, there's an ultimate resource guide that I list such apps, and I will make sure that's in the show notes of this episode as well. Um, it's the ultimate resource guide. Again, I will put it in the show notes, but it has different apps you can use to help with organization. But again, time management. Um, and 
Also, I want to go into the physical and mental wellness because sometimes when your time management is not ideal, this suffers. Because why? Because you find the time that you should be taking care of yourself to be doing your schoolwork or, you know, whatever it may be. Or maybe you, you know, binged on Netflix and now you have no time to study, you know, so it can go both ways where maybe you're not, you know, being not making school your priority. Maybe other times you're making that a priority over your own mental and physical well-being. And so I want to encourage you to try to acknowledge this as early on as possible. Go into school with a game plan on how you plan on taking care of yourself, both physically and mentally. Um, you really need this because I promise you if this crumbles, everything else will crumble along with it. You really have to take care of yourself first. All right. It's just like on the plane when they say put your oxygen mask on first. It sounds like what, what, do you, but I mean, think about it. If you pass out before you put your mask on your child, well, then you're no good. And so, you know, take care of yourself, make sure you're taken care of, and you have to make sure that this is a priority in school because again, if you don't, then the rest of the co cookie could crumble. All right. And this can be looking, this could kind of um, play out into setting boundaries. And um, I also struggle with setting boundaries. So I'm right there with you. However, I recently had to set a boundary that was really hard for me to set. Um, it is that I stopped answering personal DMs. And because I found myself cutting into my personal, my family time at all hours of the day, night, all the time. And I found myself really not being able to work efficiently during the day on Sirius Corp Academy. And it just really just didn't feel good. And I I knew something had to be ch had to change, right? Um, so I had to make the hard line, hard boundary is to let my students know if you want my time, if you want to speak with me, that you do that inside the social wall. You ask me a question. And I go live every single week to answer your questions. Um, in the meantime, I told my team to handle my DMs. My team lets people know how to reach me and helps answer, answer them and guide them. Yes, it was hard for me because I love you guys, but at the same token, I knew it was a boundary I had to set for my own mental and physical well-being because I also deserve family time and, and my and, and me time. Um, and so I felt like it was cutting into that. So I had to make that hard decision to make that boundary. This could look like anything for you. It's it's some kind of boundary. It could be a personal boundary, a physical, um, mental boundary, however it is. This could be a boundary you set with your, your friends, your spouse, your parents, whoever. You have to set boundaries that work for you. And remember, you have to make sure you are taken care of because you need to be able to give into your program. And if you're not taking care of yourself, you're not going to have much left to give. All right. So again, setting boundaries is key. This also plays into burnout. And um, I made another episode on burnout, which is episode number seven. So definitely go and check that episode out. Um, but burnout at some point will happen to most students. Now, I can't say it happens to everyone because... I hope it doesn't happen to someone, but I just know the vast majority of you will experience it, experience burnout in some shape or fashion. Um, now, it can vary in degrees, meaning you will probably all experience some type of burnout, but maybe it wouldn't be that severe. And that goes back to physical and mental wellness and setting boundaries to hopefully prevent burnout. The other aspect of burnout is awareness, you guys. And so much of mental wellness is awareness around how you are feeling and addressing that feeling. If you neglect it, and I'm guilty of it, where you know you're in trouble, you know you're suffering, you know you're not happy, but you're like, I'll be okay. I'm going to push through. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to go, 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 go. Well, next thing you know, you lose yourself, right? And, you know, I don't want that to happen to you because it's really hard to rebound from that. And I, you know, unfortunately, your clinicals can suffer, your academics can suffer. And so you really have to address burnout face on. You have to say, something's not right. I'm not handling this well. I need to figure out why. First, come up with the emotion you're experiencing and then say, what's what's causing me to feel like this? And then that's where you need to start. All right. That's number one. Number two is you have to then look for ways and strategies to help you potentially kind of not eliminate it because it might not ever go away, but help you handle it and cope with it better. OK, that's number two. And that a lot, a lot of times could be a physical activity. It could be going to the gym. I used to take my gyms to the notes or my, my gyms to the notes, my my notes to the gym. <laughs> I used to take my notes to the gym and I would sit on an arc trainer because it wasn't too bouncy and I would study. But it made me feel good because I got my my anxiety out, my stress out by being physically active. It also helped me study. So I didn't feel guilty doing it because I felt like, okay, I'm still doing schoolwork, but I'm also taking time for my physical well-being. Um, and I, then I would pop in some Lady Gaga and I would jam out, right? Okay, Lady Gaga is not really, but that was, oops. Um, 
I always thought I have my phone alarm turned off, but I always forget here and there. Anyhow, um, but that was how I coped is I would, again, jam out at the gym with some fun music, but I would also listen to my study notes or review my study notes. So again, if you want more on that, I could talk about burnout for an entire episode. So head over to episode number seven to hear more about how I kind of teach you how to cope with burnout. I also wanted to point out too that maybe um, I feel like we covered a lot today and I feel like I don't want to get this to be too overwhelming for you guys. Um, but I also covered episode number eight, clinical tips for success. And so definitely head over or head back to episode number eight to listen to more on how to be successful in the clinical realm. But I hope that this episode painted a picture on how to be successful in CRNA school. Um, thank you guys so, so much. This was so much fun. And thank you for being here, loyal listeners every week to CRNA School Prep Academy podcast. It means so much. Um, definitely head to the show notes to get more of the resources I mentioned in this episode. And of course, if you're not a CRNA School Prep Academy student, I really hope to see you inside the Academy soon. You can head over to CRNA School Prep Academy.com to learn more, and we will see you guys next week.